Hey folks, this is the sixth part of an originally three-part video series on category theory, and is a quick follow-up to my last video on monads. In that video I introduced monads and showcased some of their applications in computer programming. In this video we're going to approach monads from a totally different angle, which will give us additional insight. To get started, we first need to talk about monoids. A monoid is a set with a binary operation that's associative and unital. More specifically, it's a triple, m dot e, where m is a set, dot is a binary function on m, and e is an element of m such that these associativity and unit equations are satisfied for all elements of m. Monoids are ubiquitous. For example, the natural numbers form a monoid under addition with zero, and also under multiplication with one. Monoids are also closely connected to categories. In a category, the set of arrows from any object to itself forms a monoid under composition provided there aren't too many arrows to form a set. Conversely, for any monoid, we can define a category with a single object, whose arrows are the elements of the monoid, composed using the monoid operation. In other words, a monoid is just a category with a single object. For these reasons, categories can be viewed as generalized monoids. Monoids also form a category themselves. The objects are monoids, and the arrows are homomorphisms. A homomorphism is just a function which preserves monoid products and the unit. Composites and identities are defined in the obvious way. We can describe a monoid using diagrams in the category of sets. A set is of course an object in this category. A function on that set is of course an arrow in the category. Importantly, even an element of the set can be represented as an arrow, from one to the set, where one is any singleton. This arrow, a function, just picks out the element in question. Now, associativity of the operation means that this diagram commutes. The arrow on top here is defined like this, and it's actually a natural isomorphism. You should pause the video and confirm that this commutative diagram is equivalent to the associativity equation in the definition of a monoid. Translating between equations and diagrams is a very useful skill to develop when doing category theory. Similarly, unity means that this diagram commutes. The natural isomorphisms on top just pair an element of m with the element in the singleton. Again, you should confirm this equation is equivalent to the unit equation for a monoid. Now, it might seem like we're just making simple things complicated with these diagrams, but they're actually useful. Using these diagrams, we can transport the concept of a monoid from the category of sets to any category with analogs of the Cartesian product and a singleton. Along these lines, let C be a category. Suppose there's a functorial binary operation on C, which is associative and unital for an object I, as seen here. The operation being functorial means that it applies to arrows as well as objects, and associativity and unity hold for arrows as well. Then C is called a strict monoidal category. It's strict because we have equalities here rather than natural isomorphisms as we had in the category of sets. The operation is called the monoidal product. The object I is called the monoidal unit. Now a monoid object in C is an object M together with two arrows for which associativity and unit diagrams commute. Mu is called the monoid multiplication, and eta is called the monoid unit. This is the associativity diagram. Notice this is just like the diagram we saw earlier in sets, but with the monoidal product instead of the Cartesian product. It's actually a little simpler since we just have equality on top. This is the unit diagram. Again, it's just like the diagram we saw earlier, but with the monoidal product and unit. At this point, it's worth taking a step back to reflect on what we've done here. To review, so far we have introduced the concept of a monoid in the category of sets, we've expressed that concept using diagrams in sets, and using those diagrams we've transported the concept to an arbitrary strict monoidal category with monoidal product and unit. You might wonder, why on earth are we doing all this? Is it just because we hate ourselves? That's not the only reason. Another reason is that we can now specialize the concept to a familiar monoidal category and derive great profit from this. For an arbitrary category C, the functor category C to the C is a strict monoidal category under composition. Recall this category has for objects functors on C, and for arrows natural transformations between those functors. The objects are called endofunctors. The monoidal product of two endofunctors is given by composition, which we know is associative and unital. The monoidal product of natural transformations is a little harder to describe, 
but is given by the diagonal of this commutative square. If you think about it for a minute, you'll see that this is the natural way to get from one composite functor to the other. In particular, we have these important special cases when one of the natural transformations is an identity. Now, what is a monoid object in C to the C? It's an endofunctor T with two natural transformations, mu and nu. Mu maps from T squared to T since our monoidal product is functor composition. Nu maps from the identity functor 1 to T. The natural transformations make these associativity and unit diagrams commute. This should all look very familiar to you from the last video. That's because it's just a monad. This means that a monad on a category C is a monoid object in the monoidal category of endofunctors of C under composition. You can start with this as the definition of a monad if you really want to confuse someone, but I don't recommend it. The cool thing here is that a monad, which at first sight might have looked a little strange, is just an instance of one of the most familiar types of objects in mathematics, a monoid. Recall for the category of types and functions in the lambda calculus, the functors are functorial types, and the natural transformations are polymorphic functions. So a monad in the lambda calculus is just a monoid for a functorial type under composition. Using diagrams, we can also translate the concept of a monoid homomorphism into that of a monad homomorphism. Let S and T be monads on C. Then a monad homomorphism from S to T is a natural transformation making these diagrams commute. These diagrams are just the result of translating diagrams from monoid homomorphisms. The diagram on the left says that H preserves monad products, while the diagram on the right says that H preserves the monad unit. Let's look at an example. Recall from the last video that in the lambda calculus, we can model non-deterministic computation using the list monad consisting of the list type together with return and concat functions. While lists are a natural choice for this, we could also do it with a set monad consisting of a functorial set type together with singleton and union functions defined in the obvious way. We looked at a monad like this in the category of sets, but the same idea works in the lambda calculus. Intuitively, these models of non-determinism are similar. In fact, the polymorphic function sending a list to its underlying set is a monad homomorphism because it plays well with singletons and flattening, as you can easily verify. Since monoids form a category, so do the monads for a given category. No matter how abstract we get, it seems like we always find ourselves back in a category. All right, I've said everything I want to say about monads for now. I hope you enjoyed these videos. If so, be sure to subscribe, like, share, Maybe take a picture of yourself doing that and send it to a loved one. Here are the references I used while making this video series. Thanks for watching.